Hey, everybody. Uh, just had to make sure I didn't, I finally got the mute off before I started talking. It's like the first time ever. So, hey, we, um, thank you. Thank you for the applause. Yes, that's the best joke I'll tell all night. Anyways, uh, hey, I just wanted to welcome you to Encounter. If this is your first time, I know there are a couple people here that this is their first time. I just wanted to introduce myself. My name is Garrett Cars, and I'm the director here at, at Encounter, and we just want to welcome you and let you know that we love you and we care about you, and we're so excited that you're here. And this week, we're actually continuing this series that we called Family. Um, And so we're going to talk about this thing. One of the things we talked about a lot as we started uh, last semester was family on mission. And that's kind of our mission statement as a ministry. And so we're really diving into what that looks like. And so today we're going to be in um, Mark chapter 2. If you have your Bibles, you guys can turn there um, with me, Mark chapter 2. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn there. I want to give this little introduction to kind of the message, but before you do, I just want to take a moment and spend some time in prayer for the message. Lord, we um, love you. I pray that you would just use me as your vessel, that this message wouldn't be about me or even a ministry or a church, Lord. This is just be about you. And I pray that um, all we would focus on is you. All We would understand that all we need is you and that this is a time to come together as a family and read your word, open it up. And I pray that you would make your word alive to our hearts, that it would be like um, the bread of life like you promise us that it is. I pray this message would um, not just impact this moment, impact this ministry, impact this town, Lord, that this would be a moment where we would impact a generation and even generations to come. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And so as I, um, we talked a little bit about last week, as I was praying about encounter and all these things, family was the first word that came to my mind in midst of prayer. And we, if you missed last week's message, I'd encourage you to go look at Jesus' radical, radical vision for family. So that's on, um, you can... Here's another shameless plug for all of you fans. Uh, Check out our YouTube page. You can go um, check out that message. Um, But we're going to focus on the mission side of things. And as I was really digging in, I started calling people that have been leading churches and leaders and young adult leaders and trying to figure out, hey, how, how can I help lead this ministry? How can I build a team? How can we move forward in what God wants? And one of the persons that I called, his name was John Vermilia. Now, you guys were here last semester. He came and did a domino message. So I'm just ripping off his message. And that's what we're going to talk about this week. That's why there's, that's not true. But what John said to me was, hey, family's great. Family is great, but you're missing something. You're missing the other half. You're missing the other piece because if you focus just on family, it's not gonna actually accomplish God's full design. He goes, you have to have a mission. And in that moment, it was just like so clear, family on mission. So this conversation with John really just inspired a lot of the direction that we're heading as a ministry And so as I begin to study about what does a family look like, what does it look like to be a family on mission, I realize that from the beginning of time, this was God's design, right? We open up the book of Genesis and we start reading about Adam and Eve and he gave them purpose and work. They were supposed to work the garden and Jesus or God had given them their mission, family on mission. And we see in Genesis 3, the the fall and, and sin coming into the world, but it didn't interrupt God's mission on earth. No, he gave a promise to Abraham and the nation of Israel that they were going to be blessed to be a blessing. They were going to be a light to the nations, a family on mission. We talked about this a little bit last week, that Jesus invited the disciples into a family, into this vision of family on mission. Not only did his invitation include a relationship with him, a relationship with other believers, but also a mission. And we see throughout the gospels that Jesus is sending people two by two, constantly on mission together. 
This is the vision that Jesus has for the church, is that a family on mission. And so where do we start? Where do we begin? How do we begin to do this? And I think the first step in being a family on mission is that we learn to love one another. I, after last week's message, Talia texted me a little acronym. It was family, and somebody had sent it to her and was like, I'm sure Garrett would like this because it's kind of cheesy, but, and so I'm going to use it because they, they're right. And, uh, but it's family. Um, forget about me. I love you. Forget about me. I love you. And it's not this forgetfulness that we're completely like, um, unaware of our emotional and spiritual walk, but it's this awareness of there are other people who have needs that are part of my family. We talked about last week, bearing one another's burdens and all of this stuff. The first step into living this life of a family on mission is learning to love one another. And I still believe that one of the greatest evangelistic tools that we have in our belt is that our love for one another, when people see our love for each other, that they will understand that there's something different about us. And Jesus says in John 13, that people will know you are my disciples by your love for one another. There's something different about a family that loves one another. It's a family on mission. This is the first step of building a family on mission. This is the first step. But here's the thing, a couple things happen As we begin to build community, a couple things happen. And the first thing, and and not necessarily the first thing, but there's this invisible pull for some reason, Christianity, and and maybe you've experienced it, but there's this invisible, invisible pull towards narcissism. I have no idea what that word means. I just said it because Nathan knows. No, narcissism is like a selfishness. It's all about me. There's this invisible pull about churches where it, it, all, it comes about all of us. It's about meeting the needs of the people. And then all of a sudden we start to get so selfish and we talk about that our pastor's not funny and that uh, uh, the worship leader, he didn't sing the right songs. He didn't sing Oceans for the 10 billionth time. And all of these things, all of a sudden we get so ingrained in our little box, there's this invisible pull towards narcissism. And that's not the calling of God of a family on mission, it's not about us. Because see, the thing about this is while we're learning to love one another, if we get pulled into narcissism, we will completely forget that there is a dying world, people who have no idea about God surrounding us every single day. People who are looking for love, belonging, enjoyment, fulfillment, and the very thing they're looking for we have in this room, but we've completely forgot about all that stuff because it's all about us and we want the church to cater to our needs. It's not about me. It's not about us. It's about being a family on mission. And I don't want us as a ministry to become narcissistic where it's all about us. It's all about encounter. It's all about the worship. It's all about the funny jokes. It's all about the speakers we bring in. I don't want it to be about that. I want us to be pointing to Jesus. And that's the point of this message. Here's the thing that's so convicting to me. I believe that our generation has the most access to biblical teaching ever. We have the most access to teaching and preaching. You can go on Instagram, be careful online and on social media of who you're listening to. Just want to give a little warning shot out there. But you can find biblical teachers and preachers and women theologians and men theologians and all these people who are teaching great things. We have more access to biblical teaching than any other generation on the face of the planet. And what has it led to? Declining belief in God. 
church attendance is going down. They say that now that regular church attenders only come once or twice a month. And our generation, it's like 75 to 80% of people who grew up in the church are never going back to church. What has our access led to? And I would propose it may be from a lack of people who are living out the God-given mission that God has given us. Now, this isn't some message where I'm here to say, I'm trying to beat you down. I'm trying to uh, tell you that you're not good enough. No, what I'm saying is that if we allow narcissism to well up in us as a ministry, this is exactly what will happen. That we'll lose sight of the God-given vision that he has for a family on mission. It's time for us to get outside of the four walls of church. But I don't believe that narcissism is the vision for family that God has. We, I said that we're going to read Mark chapter 2, and I will make good on that promise. I believe this is a picture. I, I believe that there are more pictures in Scripture that we could have gone to, but I believe that this is a picture of Jesus' vision for family on mission. Mark chapter 2, we're going to read and starting in verse 1. It says this, A few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come. They gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left not even outside the door. And he preached the word to them. Some men came, bringing to him a paralyzed man carried by four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it and then lowered the man, sorry, then lowering the mat that the man was laying on. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, now this is interesting, son, your sins are forgiven. Verse six, now some of the teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. He's, and that's just simply like he's talking about God and he's not telling the truth. That's what that word um, kind of means. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately Jesus knew in his spirit that it was uh, what they were thinking in their hearts and he said to them, why are you thinking these things? Which is easier to say to a paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take out your mat, and walk. But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. He got up, took his mat, walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everyone, and they praised God, saying, we've never seen anything like this. It's in this interesting passage. It's a, such an interesting passage because I think it illustrates exactly what Jesus wants for us. What if we knew that it was our job, that it was our mission to get people to Jesus? What if we knew that it was our mission to eliminate all barriers so that we could get people to Jesus? These four dudes were carrying a paralyzed man around. They had heard about Jesus. This is at the beginning of his ministry. Not, word had not spread that much and they had heard maybe a rumor, maybe a story. And on that one thing, they had never met Jesus before. On that one thing, that one story, maybe more, but what we know is that they had enough faith that if they could just get their friend to Jesus, he would make them well again. What if we knew that it was our job to eliminate all distractions, to eliminate all hurdles, all barriers, just to get people to Jesus? I can remember a conversation that I was having in the line at Walmart. Now, I've been reading this book about, it's called The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. It's by John Mark Comer. And one of the things that he says is, hey, if you wanna slow down, get in the longest line at Walmart. Dude, why would you write that in a book? Like, I'm like, I'm not doing that. And then I'm like, okay, I need to slow down. I don't need to be in a hurry. So I got in the second longest line at Walmart. 
And guess what happened? The longest line went faster. I don't know what God was trying to teach me. I don't know why this happened to me, but I'm sitting in line and I'm watching just, and I'm just like, what in the world? And I'm like, I, oh, I should have known better. I should have gotten the longest line. Uh, God's favor is on those people, not on me right now. And so I, I'm sitting in there and, and it says that once you get to the cash uh, the cash register, treat the person like a human and not a human ATM robot. And I was like, oh, that's good. Okay. So I'm doing good. I'm already angry about all this other stuff. Cause that line went longer and I'm not in a hurry. I promise. And I get up there and I'm just like, okay, get this one part, right. <laughs> just get this one part, right. And I, I'm, I was like, Hey man, how are you doing? And he kind of acts shocked just a little bit. And he's like, fine. And I think that's where most people kind of end the conversation. Right, and, and I'd heard him kind of talking about uh, some of his story with a woman before, and so I started like, hey, I heard you know, you're doing this. Hope that's not creepy that I was listening, but, um, and we started having a conversation, and eventually he's like, so what do you do here, man? I'm like, do I tell him, or do I just tell him I'm a stay-at-home dad? Like, I just don't know which one to tell him. Like, stay-at-home dad, that's a little weird for most men in the room. It's just called being a dad. So uh, I, we don't babysit. We actually take care of our children as a man. So just a little uh, pedestal I had to get on for a minute. Um, anyways, back to the story. So I'm like, hey, man, yeah, I... I uh, I travel around the country and I share about Jesus. And when I'm here in Hayes, I help lead uh, a college ministry. It's called Encounter. He's like, yeah, I've, I've not heard of them. I'm like, well, our church roof blew off. And that was the next thing I said. And he's like, yeah, I don't know, man. It's like, okay, well, you obviously don't know where we are. I was like, I was like okay, well, that was, now what do I say? Uh, and I'm standing there and you'd think that I'm perfect. Like I'm really good at talking to people. I'm not, like I'm not, it's awkward and all of these things. And finally he just like, he starts like, yeah, dude, I got really burnt out on church. He's like, the last church I was at, they tried to raise like $100,000 to fix their roof. And I'm just like, <laughs> All right, well, can you pack those things up real quick? Because I don't want to get out of here. And so I'm just, I'm doing this. And finally, I'm just like, yeah, man, I, hey, I understand. Like, I'm sorry that uh, your church didn't treat money that the way they should. And I just kind of started sharing with him a little bit. Like, yeah, I got burnt out on church when I was in, when I was young. And all of these things. And all of a sudden, I just see this guy opening up to the message of Jesus. And, and I just said, hey, I, I know that... Um, we're missing a roof and stuff, but you can still come to our church and uh, insurance is going to cover it. So we're not going to ask you for money and uh, hopefully and uh, just just maybe later and uh, about other stuff. And I just said, hey, I, you know, I just want you to say, you could come and just check it out. And from I mean, you would think I had a 30 minute conversation. It was literally maybe three minutes. All of that happened. And from the beginning to the end, I saw this guy open up to the message of the gospel. Not because of me, just it was all God's grace. I can promise you that. But all of a sudden, I felt like I was helping him get over some barriers. That I was helping him get over some barriers that had kept him away from church. And I'm standing in the second longest line at Walmart. And all of a sudden, Jesus gives me an opportunity to help that guy get next to Jesus. I don't, he's never come. I haven't seen him here, but my hope is that I just played a small part in this role. And I, as I continued um, really just thinking about this message, I, I just really felt like I was supposed to share something with you guys. Last semester, I got really convicted uh, because I had the hardest time inviting people to come. Now, I know that seems weird to you, right? The guy who's leading the ministry, he can't even invite people. Like, that seems pretty awkward. I can remember at the barbecue that we had on campus that I would sit down with people and they're like, what's Encounter? And I'd just be like, it's this really cool thing and you should check, you know, come. And like, and I was just, I was so awkward because I, what I realized is that was actually my insecurity. Because what if they came and they heard my lame jokes? What if they came 
and something happened. They didn't like the preaching. And what I realized is that I was missing out on the mission that Jesus had given me because I was insecure. I became so convicted as I read this passage that these men were so mission-minded that they were willing to do whatever, whenever to get people to Jesus. And what I want to say to you is that there might be some people in this room who are feeling really insecure about being on mission with Jesus. That you don't want to tell your parents or you don't want to talk to that person about uh, Christianity or you don't want to invite your roommate or whatever it may be. I just want you to know that Jesus' invitation to mission encapsulates everything. It will fulfill our ever inner longing. And we will walk into a deeper sense of purpose and fulfillment that I believe that we ever have or can before we walk into this mission. And I just want you to say that Jesus will walk alongside of you in your insecurity, in your doubt, in your lack of faith, whatever you may be struggling with. Jesus didn't beat me over the head with this, like, you're so insecure. I can't believe you wouldn't do all of these things. No, Jesus really, in this moment of grace and love, was just like, man, I understand. I understand that you sometimes are insecure about all of these different things and that it's affecting this area of your life. And so as I began to realize that, it was really my insecurity, what it ultimately led to, it all led, is that I was making this all about me. That I wasn't trying to put my fame up there or get famous or do all those other things. No, I was radically insecure about who God had called me to be. I just like hearing her talk. Sorry, I was taking a moment. <laughs> and so where are you? I want to ask you, where are you in walking into God's mission for your life? I said this last week, but we will never be fully what God has designed until every single person in this room's room walks fully into what God has asked them to do. We will never be what we're called to be as a ministry until you say yes to the invitation that God has given you and us as a ministry. And what I ultimately realized through all of this stuff, it was a radical mind shift for me, is that this is not about me. It's not about me, but it's about an encounter with the risen Christ. See, what I had done was I was treating my ministry, my stuff, my other, all these other things that I was doing, I was actually trying to play God himself. I wanted people to come to me. I wanted people to do the things for me. I was treating like as if he wasn't raised from the dead, that he's not alive and he can handle himself. I believe that I was really treating Jesus as if he was dead because I wasn't making it about him. And so once I learned that I was radically insecure, that I was making it about me, I realized it's not. And this is about Jesus. It's about people encountering with Jesus and almost every single time I see somebody that I don't know if they go to encounter or not, I realize that by a simple invitation, I'm just asking them not to come for the worship, not to come for the message, not to come for the funny jokes, none of those things. I'm asking them to come so they can encounter the risen Christ. And we've been given the same mission as well. So if you're here last semester, John gave this message that he called dominoes. Dominoes. Simple thing. Pretty simple. I don't know how to play it <laughs> unless you just knock them over. I don't, I think that's how you're supposed to play it. <laughs> That's not true. I got beat really badly by some Muslims. They, I'm pretty sure they were, treat, like they were cheating, but I'm, I don't know. They literally kicked my butt every single time I play. I was like, man, I just line them up and just knock them over. Anyways, side story. 
But <laughs> thanks for laughing at that. I appreciate it. Hey, uh, but John was talking about how we can help people get closer to Jesus by simply inviting them to encounter, inviting them to a life group, sharing the gospel with them, uh, loving them when they're going through a difficult circumstance. It might be any of these things. And John has uh, really just, he's gone across the world and he's talking about being on mission with Jesus. And after he came, I was sitting with him on the way back to the Hayes airport, it took forever to get there. And uh, I just said, hey, we, like, Siri, do you know, I don't know what I was going to ask her, but that would have been cool. Uh, what I asked him was, hey, can I steal your idea of dominoes? Because I want a visual representation of what it means for us to be a family on mission. And he said, absolutely. He goes, I, you can take it as much as you want. And so what I want us to do as a ministry is I know that a lot of you have come forward and you've gotten a domino, but what I want us to do is have a visual representation of, of what it means to be a family on mission, that we're willing to work um, for Jesus and work uh, helping people get across the barriers, the things that are in the way. Maybe they're struggling with family issues or whatever it is, and I can remember this time where um, before I heard this message, but I'd started coming to encounter we had gotten, the leadership team had received an email from a concerned mom, and she's like, hey, listen, my son is shy, uh, his name is Paul, and I, could you just go get him? And I was like, what the heck? I was like, does he have no cell phone number, no email address, It only given us a room number, like his dorm room number, <laughs> Right? And so here I am, and our, the former leader, uh, Dr. B, he literally just hands me the email on a printed out piece of paper, and he's like, here you go. And I'm like, oh, what is this? And I start reading, and I'm just like, I'm going to go get him. And so here I am, I'm driving down the bypass, I show up, go up to McMinus, I don't know what floor it is. It's still sketchy back then as it is today. And I go up to his dorm room. I'm standing outside. I'm just like, I'm, I'm here. It's like, bang, 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 bang. And I'm like, he ain't here. <laughs> you know? I was like, he's not here. And I'm just standing there. It seemed like an eternity. It's probably five seconds. And all of a sudden, this dude opens the door just in his underwear. And I'm like, hey, bro, what's up? I said, are you Paul? And he goes, yeah. And I'm like, hey, I'm going to encounter. You want to go with me? Standing in his underwear. And I'm just, I'm like, at this point, I was like all in when I knocked. Like, I can't back out. Like, I don't know what to do. And so I'm standing there and he just looks at me like dumbfounded that I'm standing in front of him and that he actually opened the door with his underwear on. And so I think he thought I was an RA, but whatever. Anyways, he just looks at me. He's like, yeah. I was like, you want to get dressed? He's like, yeah. I was like, all right, let's go, man. You get dressed. And so he comes to encounter. I drive him to encounter. He, he ends up, he plugs into a life group and he ended up moving away from Fort Hayes after his freshman year, but all because this mom sent us an email and I was just kind of a weird dude that really loved Jesus. I'm just banging on dorm doors. Like, don't, I'm not advocating that. Uh, but just because somebody had sent us an email and there's a person who was willing to go, all of a sudden, dominoes had started following, falling in his life. And he helped and got involved with Encounter, and we started living out this family on mission. So here's how I want to end this message, and the band can start making their way back up here to sing a few songs for some of you, you came forward last semester and you picked up one of these dominoes. And I know I've seen them on keychains. People have told me they carry them every single day. And what I want us to do again tonight is to make this commitment to Jesus' invitation to be a family on mission.
to be willing to do whatever, whenever, to help people overcome their obstacles that are keeping them from Jesus. And so as we sing the next couple of songs, if you don't have a domino or maybe you do and you just need to come forward and you need to renew your commitment, whatever that looks like, if you're ready to say yes to Jesus' invitation to be a family on mission, I just want you to come forward and grab a domino. Just as a reminder, you can put it wherever you want. But just as a visual representation that we don't have to have it all together. We don't have to be perfect. We're not professional Christians. Jesus picked the weirdest dudes on the face of the planet and they got it done. People who were sinners, people who were um, cheaters, they would cheat on their taxes, all of these things. The only thing that qualifies you to be on mission with Jesus is that you've been with him. And let's go out and do this together. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for the four men who we never know their names who were willing to say yes just to getting somebody closer to you. When you saw their faith, you led them into a deep relationship with you and you cleansed them of their uh, their sickness. And I pray that we would be people who don't make this about us, but we make it about you. I pray that you would eliminate pride in my life. That my mission on this earth would be like those four men doing whatever, doing the hard work of ripping the roof off of this place just to get somebody to you. And I pray that people in this room would say yes to you too. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.